Happy New Year in these complicated times. Happy New Year. Thank you so much for joining us for what we understand to be the lead event of the year, our first event of the year, and what I'm sure will be one of our most enriching events of the year. This is a lecture series that we share with the Waterloo Public Library, of which we are very uh, proud, very enthused, our One Sky Over All series. But tonight, a very special guest, as you have already heard and who we are delighted to welcome and to welcome in particularly as a reflection of all that Renison stands for. Renison is a university college uh, at the University of Waterloo and our motto is reflected in the series title, uh, One Sky Over All in Latin Z Coelum Solum. Our motto actually reflects very much how we understand the work which we do and why we are here tonight. Renison offers undergraduate and graduate programs in social development studies and in social work and in culture and language studies and it is particularly our culture and language studies degree program and our community education programs in culture and language studies that bring us here to this event tonight at Renison with our vision of one sky over all, a world where there is a place for everyone at the table with meaningful voice, a place where all are greeted with respect and dignity and an opportunity to come to voice. That one sky over all leads us to understand very, very deeply that words are powerful things. Words have power. Words open us. They speak to us. They change us. They save us. In the spirit of that deep knowing of the power of words, we are so delighted that Ms. Tamavangsa has agreed to join us tonight in celebration of her Giller Prize winning volume, How to Pronounce knife. And the answer to that, how to pronounce knife, is ka naif. Ka naif. <laughs> ka naif. I have the privilege of introducing uh, a very dear colleague of mine who will introduce uh, Ms. Tama Vasanga and her work for us tonight. And our, uh, our speaker who will introduce our guest and who will moderate our conversation is Dr. Vin Noyen. Dr. Vin Noyen is a, a recent associate professor with tenure at Huron at Renison University College. I have to say this about Vin. One of the proudest things I have being president at Renison University College, Vin was the first professor that was hired uh, after I started my work as president at Renison. And I thought to myself as we engaged the process of welcoming him into Renison's One Sky Overall Vision, I thought, oh yes, if this is the way, this is the way. And certainly Dr. Noyan has proven to reflect everything that Renison embodies in its deepest and truest, most virtuous, although imperfect in the Renison sense self. Uh, he is a scholar of deep wisdom and integrity. He is himself an award-winning scholar. And although 2020 was a pretty crummy year for the world, it was a good year for Renison because it was in 2020 that Dr. Noyan received tenure and was promoted to associate professor. And we are so very proud to delight with him uh, in that. So I would like to invite uh, Vin to uh, introduce our speaker and to lead us through the complex labyrinth of this complex and beautiful thought of our guest author tonight. I just, I just want to flag as I invite him to do that, how important the word knife is for us tonight, because it is a true thing that words do cut like a knife. They cut us open. And I do entirely expect that in our engagement with our author tonight, we will be cut open in a way which changes us. So Vin, over to you. Thank you so much, Wendy, um, for that incredibly generous uh, introduction. And re it really is my honor to be a part of the Renison community. Um, and um, 
I would like to say uh, good evening to everyone and also first to thank uh, Nancy and the folks at the Waterloo Public Library for hosting us tonight. Um, it really is a shame that we can't actually uh, all be in, in, in person and be surrounded by books um, in the library. Um, and also thanks to my colleagues at Renison University College, um, especially Court Egan, um, our Dean Kofi Campbell and um, our President Wendy Fletcher um, for supporting this event. Um, and really for making this all happen. Um, it's my immense pleasure to introduce uh, Suvankam Flamavangsa, winner of the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize for her collection of short stories, How to Pronounce Knife. Flamavangsa's fiction has appeared in Harper's, Granta, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, Plowshares, The Journey Prize Stories, and The O. Henry Prize Stories. Um, basically, um, every single important collection uh, or, or magazine. Um, her debut collection of fiction um, is one of Time Magazine's must-read books of uh, 2020. Tamavangsa is also the author of four poetry books, Light, winner of the Trillium Book Award for Poetry, Found, Small Arguments, winner of the Relit Award, and most recently, uh, Cluster. Born in the Lao refugee camp in Nong Khai, Thailand, she was raised and educated in Toronto, where she now lives. Um, thank you so much, Subangam, for being here with us tonight. And congratulations again on really just an incredible year for you. Um, you know, really filled with so many um, accolades. So tell us uh, what you've been up to since winning the Giller Prize. What has life been like? Well, first, I'd like to say thank you so much for inviting me um, to do this event tonight. Um, what I've been up to, um, I just try to keep it um, the same. Um, I don't want a prize to change my habits as a writer or um, my thinking as a writer. Um, prizes, you know, are not an automatic, even for good books. Um, there are many good books that we never hear about in a year. Um, it's, tr it's true that last year, um, anybody who put out a book, um, it felt um, heartbreaking and difficult not to be able to launch or to have a public event to show that it was real and there in the world and there was a reception. Um, but, you know, the lovely thing about a book is it remains a book. Um, everything between the pages um, remains what it was 20 years ago when you started it or three years ago. It's what it is. Um, and when it gets printed, it's, um, it, it stays the same. Um, what else? What have I been up to? Um, I, I'm still reading, working on a novel, and cooking, really, um, trying to make recipes and food that uh, I had at home as a kid. <laughs> um, what What are some of those recipes? Can you share with us uh, some of the some of that? You know, I mean, because food is so comforting and. And it, I love that, you know, it's like, I've just won the Gilder Prize and I'm staying at home and making all this, you know, amazing <laughs> food from my childhood uh, for um, myself. I like to make um, hand cut noodles out of um, tapioca powder and rice powder. Um, I like to make lap, um, long bean salad, uh, raw papaya salad. Um, Lao sausages. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds incredible. Um, have you found time? Have you found time to write? I mean, I know you've all, you've been very busy. You've been doing an event every single week. Um, I know, and 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 I mean, as much as you're kind of telling us how you're trying to find a kind of normalcy in life, um, yeah. I know it has been a huge change, and you've been incredibly busy. Um, so I want to hear about um, the writing. Like, how do you get back to the pen and paper? You know, how do you get back to the writing with so much that's been going on? Um, 
Well, I'm not new to writing. I've been writing for 25 years. And so I know how to get back to the page um, no matter what happens. Um, that's just like a kind of, um, like a kind, that's just a kind of um, a thing that is consistent and um, that I just have an inner compass to get back to the writing, um, even though there are many distractions. Um, I've been working on, I worked on three short stories and I went back to read the novel that I wrote um, in six weeks um, about a year ago. And I was looking over my sentences at the voice um, and uh, just to be in touch with the person who wrote that like a year ago um, feels, feels different, but also very powerful um, that I know how to do this and I've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you have a novel that's coming out. Um, could you uh, sort of tell us a bit, a bit about that novel, you know, for us to, what, what should we, what should we be anticipating and what can we expect from you in the near future? Um, if you like uh, the short story in How to Pronounce Knife, Manny Petty, it's very similar to that, the sister and brother relationship. I just, when I stopped writing Manny, when I finished the short story, Manny Petty, I missed the characters and the voice um, and I just wanted it to continue. So that's there in the novel. But of course, I'm a person who likes to make things harder for myself. Um, I can't just sit back and lean on the thing that, 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 I, that has already been done. Um, I am really interested in point of view and a writer that comes to mind that plays with this a lot is Raymond Queneau and, um, his exercises in style and um, what in his book, what he does is he takes a single event, but, he's, but he tells it in different points of, um, in different ways and points of views. And so that's what I want to do with my novel. There is some sort of event that we don't really know about, um, but everyone's talking about it. That's, that's really exciting. Um, I know so many of us um, are really looking forward to that. Um, but now let's, sorry, you were gonna say them? Oh, I was gonna say, uh, you said, what can we expect from you? Um, yeah. I, I, uh, I was asked to do, um, an, I have an interview, an, like an author Q&A with um, Katsuo Ishiburo in March. And I have a short story that is forthcoming in the New Yorker. Um, so that's, it, it's coming out late February, early March. So that's, what, it's a new story. I wrote it last year in June. So um, watch out for that. Oh, that's amazing. Absolutely. Um, let's actually turn to uh, how to pronounce knife. Um, could you read us something from that collection? Sure. I'm going to read from a story in it called A Far Distant Thing. It's really about what we know and what we don't know and what is the value of not knowing. The mold on the walls started as little black dots near the floor. When nothing was done about them, they spread up to the ceiling. The mold looked like a field of black dandelions. That's one of the things I think of when anyone asks me about where I'm from, where I grew up. My parents slept on a thin sponge mattress on the floor of the living room. Before they left for work every morning, they folded the mattress four times like a piece of paper and put it into the shoe closet. I had my own room. My window opened out to a parking lot where I saw only two things, the headlights or the exhaust pipe of a car. 
My friend Katie lived in the same building, but her, part her apartment had a balcony and a different view. We walked to and from school together, but I never invited Katie over. I didn't want her to see that my parents didn't have a bedroom. So I was always over at her place. Dad always talked about life as if it spilled out all at once and we wouldn't have time to think or do anything about what was going to happen to us. He talked like he had to tell me everything now because we'd never see each other again. I'd roll my eyes at him, but that only made him go on. Dad worked in a nail polish factory. He had started out cleaning the floors. While he cleaned, he stood behind the workers on the line and watched them peel labels and stick them onto the nail polish bottles. It didn't seem very difficult, he said. When the factory made cuts and offered the remaining workers less pay, many quit. Suddenly, there were job openings on the line, and so dad applied for one and got it. He got mom a job there too, even though those who worked on the line were now paid less than before. It was still more pay than what dad had made as a cleaner. They both loved the job. The hours were long, but the work was steady and they had their weekends free. One time during his break, he told me that a man who worked on the line with him said something about the way he worked, mimicking his speed, scooping up everything around him. Dad thought it was a compliment, so he pretended to pick things up too, agreeing that was the best way to work. He was happy someone at the factory was talking to him instead of pulling at the skin on the side of their eyes and laughing as he walked by. It wasn't until the foreman laid off a few more workers who couldn't keep pace that they started, com that they started to come up to him and say a word to his face that sounded like spitting. It took so much air to make that word, but the spit never arrived. He asked me what they were calling him at the factory. This thief thing, what is it? I didn't want to tell him. I wanted him to go on liking his job, to get up in the morning with a sense of purpose and pride like he did. I told him I had never heard of this word before. Then I turned away so I wouldn't have to look at his face as he told me. All you have to do is work hard. That's all it is, hard work. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, the, you know, the passage that you read out for us and what you said about the idea of, of what we know and what we don't know is so tied to language, right? Um, and that's kind of a theme that really runs through um, so much of your work. Um, and I want to think about, you know, how language is used and what it does and how we see that language in some ways cannot always represent what these characters, you know, who are uh, working class, who are refugees and immigrants um, and really outsiders, right? How language can't really represent what they know and what they experience and what they feel. Um, and so I wanna ask you to speak a little bit about this idea of, of language, right? And of course, you know, the, the, the words that, you know, cannot be pronounced or um, have alternate pronunciations and words and their meanings. Um, so I wonder if you can kind of um, discuss for us and, and talk through this idea of, of words and how they capture what we know and what we don't know. Um, we often think that knowing a thing is good. Um, I think sometimes we are uncomfortable sitting with something we don't know. We have to know it. And especially in this time where if you don't know something, you could just Google it. Um, but the thing is, even when you Google it, 
you have to have some sort of knowledge to be able to filter what you're reading um, and what you see there. Um, you know, you have to question if it's even true. Um, just because something exists on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Um, so you do have to know. Um, I think in my stories, um, people know different things even when they don't know, like the father who doesn't know the word knife. Um, he, he knows how to make a living for his family. Um, a woman who doesn't know that the world is round, but she's experienced war. Um, she'd seen someone die in her arms, um, knowing that the world is round um, is no big thing. Um, or even in the story I just read, um, not knowing the meaning of thief, um, and the child not telling the father that meaning, um, that not knowing um, does not disrupt his joy and happiness of, you know, getting up and going to do his work. Um, imagine if he knew that the people around him was calling him, you know, um, saying something terrible to him. A job um, is many hours of your life. And if you go and do that job and you feel you're surrounded by people who don't care for you or don't see you as one of their own, um, it's an awful place to be. Um, and so the decision for, that the child makes in the story to not give her father the knowledge and the meaning or the education of that word is something that saves him, that lifts him as a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so fascinating because I think you're presenting to us this idea of sort of not knowing as a way of protecting oneself, right? And protecting oneself in the world and, and, and of survival and moving, right? Like it's, it's a way of living in the world um, to not know. And then we tend to think differently, right? We tend to think we, we, we can participate in the world if we know it, right? And if we know everything. Even how, even um, how we come to know, like often we know things because we can read, um, mm -hmm. but there are many ways to read too. Um, and it's not just words, it's how we read um, if we're safe, if we're with people who make us feel safe. And that doesn't have to do with words, that has to do with a particular look or just intuition, those are, forms of knowledge that are valuable as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to um, spend too much time on this, but you know, as you're speaking to, I'm thinking about the final story and the idea of that character, the mother character who really knows really on an embodied level, right? She, she can feel, right. she knows how to pick worms and she right. is, you know, what you would call an expert, right? She has right. all the skills, all the know-how, all the techniques, um, that really comes from, from, from years and years of doing something. Um, she knows it so well in her own body how to do such things. And yet, in some ways, that's the thing that, um, that works against her, right? Um, right. I don't want to <laughs> ruin that story for people who haven't read that. But, you know, knowing something so well can also um, uh, be used against you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, that's a really great way of describing that story, then. Um, okay, so uh, many readers are discovering your work for the first time uh, because of this, uh, uh, because of your fiction, you know, because of this amazing uh, short story collection. Um, but you've been writing for over two decades now, um, and you um, have been writing poetry, right? You've you've mm -hmm. won, you've you've uh, won a lot of acclaim for your poetry and amassed um, a devoted following for that poetry. Um, so you've been doing it for a really long time now. So could you just maybe talk a little bit about that, about, about what it means to have been writing for so long um, uh, and, uh, and, and I think to kind of perhaps get more recognition now um, through your fiction? Um, that's what I mean when I said earlier that, um, you know, to stay grounded, to keep a routine, to live, 
your life as if you've already won so that if it should, ha you know, when you win, that's not something you can control. That is something a jury decides and it's outside of you. Um, and um, I think it's possible to do work that matters and is important and you don't have to wait for anyone to crown you. Um, and while I have won like some awards for the poetry, they were never on the scale of like the award, the like the Giller um, or any fiction award or any fi attention that fiction can draw. Um, I've been writing um, since I was poetry since I was in high school, um, and I started with you know before we had computers. I did it on a typewriter. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I learned the technology of, uh, you know, when it changed. Um, first, I learned how, you know, I was one of those people who went out and bought a ribbon because that is an ink that, you know, uh, and I knew uh, you had to, back, you, back then you had to measure the margins of a page in order to know when, where to start typing. Um, that's what I did. And then, but um, I, and then when the technology changed, um, the writing and the poetry and the mind and the thinking behind it for me did not, even though the thing that produces it or that, that I use, the tool that I use to make it um, has changed. But the way that I think, um, the questions that I ask myself, the things that I'm constantly trying to make difficult, um, they remain the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, could you read some poetry for us? Yes. Um, what I want to do is I'm actually going to read three poems. One will be from my very first book, which was published in 2003 um, by Peddler Press. Um, it's called Water. Water will lie to you, make you believe this unmarked end isn't deep, until you go in without enough air to find your way back. It breaks light before light knows where it is and takes shape uncertain of its own. In the palm of a hand, a glass lifted to drain. If you wait long enough, you can watch it give up its grooves, its scars, keeping warm, cold, losing itself in what it didn't want to become. Um, my brother had wondered why I never wrote poems about him. And so, uh, he says, nobody knows you have a brother. And so, to honor him, I wrote this poem. <laughs> <laughs> it's called, My Mother Gave Me. My mother gave me a photo album. There were a handful of pictures and I am the same age in every one. There is one photo of me and my father on the day he taught me how to ride my bike. We are laughing and in the lower left corner is a small boy sitting on a park bench watching us. He's my brother. I always thought he was the favorite one, the one they really wanted. I did not think of what I might have looked like to him. He is looking on in this photo, sitting on a park bench. He does not have a bike of his own. It is the same with his clothes. The clothes he wore had been mine, green overalls, blue shirt, all the winter jackets and snow suits, never knowing the feel of new things. Even the haircut he has is mine. In a few years, he too will have this bike, but no one will have taken the time to teach him how to ride it without the training wheels because they had come off years before. 
He will ride this bike as I left it, like everything else I had, and it will still be pink and the flowers printed will still be there. There will be no picture of that day. There is only a picture of this day, this day of him sitting on the park bench alone, hands in his lap, looking on and waiting for his turn. That was from a collection um, that was published by McKellen and Stewart called Cluster. Um, they, they are the publisher of How to Pronounce Night. Um, the final poem I will be reading is called Perfect. Um, I want you to think of this word perfect as, as I read it and what it means to you. Perfect. When I am 14, my father will quit his job and sell our home. He will use the money to start a sign making business. He will start by buying computers and big heavy equipment and we will spend nights sleeping in the van. I'll try my best to sleep, to close my eyes and feel warm in my wet socks and thin winter coat. In the mornings, I'll brush my teeth at school and comb my hair so I'll look like nothing is wrong with me. I'll wander the empty dark halls before the students fill them. And sometimes I'll sing and dance like a star in a Broadway play. When I see a teacher, I'll sit quietly outside a classroom door with a heavy book in my hand, Moby Dick. The only teacher to ask is Miss Irons. I will tell her that I'm just so excited for school and I'm so happy to be here. It's not a lie. I'm happy that for the whole, for the whole of a day, I'll be warm and I can be with my friends. I don't tell her all the other stuff, that this will be the year my parents' marriage will begin to fall apart, that they'll stop dancing in the living room and that my mother will stop making me beautiful dresses which match hers from leftover materials that the bottles full of color and fragrances dry up. I didn't know it then, so how could I tell her? After school, my mother will pick me up and drive for hours. She'll sometimes stop at a lake somewhere in cottage country and listen to the radio. She'll walk back and forth, never saying anything, and I will bow my head and work out the math problems in my homework. The math problems are easy. They are always about some guy who had to get to the other side. There's always an answer, a sure thing. You just have to work your way there. Everything you need to know to solve it has already been given to you. There is no secret but the answer, shimmering alone, without any signs around it. I will keep my print small, filling up every blank space I can find, like a captain plugging leaks in a sinking ship. It will get dark, and just as the sun sets, the street lamp will turn on. I will angle my notebook to catch this light, this light. I will go back to school and hand in my notebook, and it will be perfect, perfect. It's what I've earned. A friend will lean in and announce my score and I'll hear someone ask, how'd you get perfect? I can't begin to say what it took to get it that way. It's perfect, perfect. Uh, that poem is from a collection with one word, it is titled Light, and every poem in that collection deals with that word, light. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, oh, that was gorgeous. Um, and, you know, really the poems that you've read, they, they really capture this, you know, these really poignant moments, and they are, 
in some ways stories in and of themselves, right? Um, right. And, and in their kind of small and crystalline form, they're, they're, they're telling a narrative. Um, and yet they're really quite different from your, your short stories, your, your prose. Um, so I wanna ask about, you know, ask you to reflect about the differences, right? Like, you know, the difference between telling a story in a poem and telling a story in um, uh, like a short story. I think in a poem, things go unexplained. There's a lot of space that is there and I don't have to fill. Um, that space works as a nut and bolt to the structure of the story. It is important as much as, and as valuable as the words that you do see on the page, whatever is not explained, um, you bring that into the poem um, in search for meaning um, or just in search for something tangential to hold on to. Um, and there's something, I think, there's a loneliness to the poems, like the voice is very lonely and and sing and like a dot um, where that's what it feels like to me. Um, whereas a story in um, prose is the moment, even though it can be a character alone, um, you don't feel alone because you feel the setting, the world that the story takes place. Um, and you feel the witnesses in the story, the other characters moving and orbiting around the, the main character or, mm -hmm. or the voice. And there's something where there's a beginning, middle and an end or, or like an exit. Whereas in, the, in a poem, you don't know where you've entered or if you are being told, um, the entry point is so tiny. Um, it's just a glimpse. And in that glimpse, um, in that very little material, you have to build something that a mind or heart or someone just listening can hold on to. Um, I think a lot of the paintings of uh, Agnes Martin, where um, she just paints with um, white paint. Um, and to someone just looking at it on a wall, um, it can come across as being nothing. Um, but when you get close to it, it's the strokes. Um, mm -hmm. Um, the little details that you can't see from far away, the way that she can wrestle, she can make a painting that is so bare and plain, um, feel um, not bare and plain, but it's opposite. So full of, so full um, to wrestle it, like her power is to wrestle that proximity of being nothing and make it something. And that mm -hmm. is totally hers. Um. Well, what a beautiful answer. <laughs> I didn't think you would take us there, um, but thank you so much. Um, so since this is taking place virtually um, through the Waterloo Public Library, I'd love to ask about your relationship with uh, libraries. Um, what do they mean to you? Could you perhaps talk about a moment or a memory that you have of, 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 of being in a library or a public library? For sure. I, uh, so I grew up in a home without books. Um, anytime I saw a bookshelf at my parents' friend's house, um, I always begged to take a picture in front of it. The way that, you know, people who go on vacation beg to take pictures in front of scenes that they think they won't ever get to see again sometime soon. That was me. And um, I just remember, that, so we had a school library, but it was very small. And so every year 
our teacher would take us to the, pu the closest public library. So we all got cards um, and um, we'd have a better and wider selection of books. And I remember seeing um, this section of the library of all these plastic bags and inside these plastic bags were cassettes. And, you know, maybe, I, I mean, I didn't have books at home, but I knew at home I had a cassette player. And I was so excited that you can, you know, that I had something um, at home that, um, you know, that I could, that I just had something at home. Um, and so I remember taking out a book called Rumpelstiltskin that was in a plastic bag with a cassette. Um, and I was drawn to it because it was such an unusual name, very much like mine. Um, and I went home and, you know, my parents were always busy. Um, and even when they read, my father knew how to read. He didn't read, he couldn't pronounce the words. And I remember playing the cassette and feeling um, like somebody was going to read to me and I was going to get the words right. Um, and I took such great joy in that story, Rumpelstiltskin, because um, I could, I took, it, it was so, it was, I was so giddy knowing that um, in that story, you had to guess what his name was. And he just thought that nobody knew what his name was because it was so unusual. Um, and that was my very first experience of going to the public library and discovering that somebody can read to you and teach you how to say the words um, it, it, and that you could read along with this voice that would get it right. Mm. Um, so you mentioned that you grew up in a house without books. Um, and so I, you know, the last question I want I have for you is, um, you know, could you talk about the importance of reading for you, right? Like what has reading done for you? Why do you think it's important for us to have this relationship with, with books and with reading? Right, I think, um, I think anything, you know, a lot of people see writers as people in, as people or writing as being, um, powerful or writers as having power. But for me, I know that the real power lies in the reader. Um, like I can write a million books, but like if nobody, if I reads it, what's, what, what is the point? Who can I reach? Um, who can I connect to? Um, reading can do so many things for you. It can narrow a wide, world that feels too scary, or it can widen a world that feels too small. Um, it can make you feel seen and heard. Um, and it can, it can, reading, um, it always changes you. Um, it is, it is a skill um, that never goes out of style. Um, you can mm. invent any kind of technology, um, but reading, you know, you can put it on a tablet, a typewriter, a computer, whatever, but the act of reading remains um, the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're gonna um, take some questions from the audience now. Um, so there is an individual, Susan, who is uh, going to be having a book club of your book. Yay! <laughs> um, and Susan needs help because Susan will be presenting oh. on Chikichi <laughs> and Ework. <laughs> so um, Susan is looking for some, some notes or things that, uh, that you might uh, assist her in. in um... uh, Chikichi and what? Um, Ework. Oh, okay, Ework. Yeah. Um, what kinds of things um, to assist you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess uh, to maybe 
think of a pumpkin or how often um, we see and hear from old women who are showing and talking about their bodies in a way where um, they're not ashamed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, will you be writing any stories or any writing that is um, connected to the pandemic or inspired by that? I feel like it's too soon. Um, and also, you know, pandemics um, have been around. It's not a new subject. Um, if I, I just, um, I feel like I couldn't do a good job, but there are many writers out there who are excellent um, and they can handle that as a subject and theme. But right now, I just don't think I'm the person for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a really interesting question. Um, you read with such emotion, uh, emotion and rhythmic cadence. Um, they're wondering if you've had voice lessons or stage lessons. Um, as your speaking voice is so alluring and captivating with its expression, uses of pauses and its pitch. Actually, um, in my early 20s, I spent uh, like two or three years um, in the open mic scenes in Toronto. So what that is, is um, a bar would have a reading series and you would sign up to read in um, on that night in front of a public audience. Um, and I learned I learned how to read in those audiences because in a bar you're competing for people's attention when they can have alcohol, when they can <laughs> turn to their, when they can turn to their gorgeous state, <laughs> when or or they can talk to you know the friends that they came with the uh, to the bar with or to you know the hockey game on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. So I did learn. How do you how do you talk through that noise? And um, I saw some really great readers who taught me how to do that, um, and also just going out there and trying to do that. Um, I yeah, in an open mic, um, you know, you have to earn, you have to create space and and do something with that space. It's very unforgiving. Um, like the first thing, uh, the first two words, or even the, the one word out of your mouth at first, um, if it doesn't captivate people, um, they, don't, they don't listen. And then, you know, your reading is lost. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, there used to be this, yeah, I think it still goes on the Art Bar Reading Series. And every year they have their Discovery Prize. And I do remember uh, competing for that prize. It's sort of like, um, yeah, it's a competition where if you win, you get a featured reading. And I went alone to this uh, event, the Discovery Prize Night. Um, and I read and then I saw several people going to read with a group of friends um, because they brought friends with them so that when they tallied the public vote, um, you know, they would have lots of votes because they brought friends. But the funny thing was they brought friends who ended up voting for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and I just thought, oh, I won them over. And I just thought that's, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I did it. I went there by myself and I read and I didn't ask anybody to vote for me. And mm -hmm. I turned and just to watch that turn, it just felt so amazing that I, 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 I love that feeling of winning people over. Um, I mean, that's, you know, people are very fickle and to win them over just by reading, um, I don't take that for granted at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, are you still writing poetry and are there um, contemporary poets that you would recommend? 
I'm still writing poetry. I know that um, a lot of writers sometimes use it as a stepping stone to get onto other projects like a novel. Um, but I'm do I'm not doing it as a, I'm not using it as a stepping stone. I really am a poet, <laughs> and I intend to remain that way. Um, some poet some poets um, that I recommend. Um, I really, really love the writing that Oba Osman is doing. If you're familiar with her chat book, um, Hereditary Blue, um, I recommend that you go out and get it. This is going to be a writer that you're going to hear from um, a lot in the future. Um, one that immediately also comes to mind that many people already know is Knizia Lubrin. Um, I just love everything she does. Um, she's so brilliant. Anything by Aisha Sasha John. Um, I also, she's also a dancer and I just, um, I, I really miss watching her dance on the stage. Mm -hmm. Um, could you talk about your writing process and the routine and how that has changed over time, you know, um, in terms of just even, I mean, because you, yeah, you, it, it's, it's very easy for you to come back to writing now, but, um, but in terms of just thinking about how do you develop that? The process, um, it's remained, this, it's, it, I feel like it's the same, but over time, I, I've made it harder for myself in that I don't stick to the same thing. And I, I always want to change. And the difference now as well, like before it was just me or just one other person, but now the writing um, there, you know, there are, um, there's more than one editor um, uh, and also, I think just the feeling that the, or the ex, I feel like people want something from me or are expecting something very particular. Um, and that makes it hard um, to get back to the voice that I want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, one audience member um, really loved Manny Petty and was wondering if you, um, and they especially love the gender transgressions uh, from both the brother and the sister. Um, and so they're wondering if you'll kind of play, I'll play with that a little bit more, this kind of gender, gender transgressions or playing with gender. Well, I just follow what I feel and I follow the voice I want to create. I, like I don't sit down and say, Hmm, I must do something with this gender thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I, I wanted to see women in literature saying some of the things that the sister says. Um, but I also, I also wanted to see um, someone to hear someone like Raymond and to see him talk, uh, work in an unusual job and how he would handle that environment. Um, for me, it wasn't, it was more, how do you take boxing and take it out of that world and make all the skills that make you a great boxer, how do you make that world help you as a nail artist? What there, um, what there is so special that, um, that even whatever job you end up doing, you will still be you. You will still be the same person. Um, you will still have this because you will still have the same process. Um, you know, we've talked about writing process. You know, whether you're a boxer or you work in a nail salon, the way that you see the world, your work ethic, it remains the same. It's the same with with poetry and prose or just writing. The process is the same. Mm. Um, question about why you chose the three poems that you 
read out tonight? Um, I chose them because, well, um, I really liked um, the one about my brother um, because it felt intimate in a way that the short stories feel that way. And the same um, with Perfect. Um, it is based on a true real life event. Um, and just tonight thinking back about, um, you know, when you, when you win a prize, you think about the moments when there was no prize like when you're 16, uh, I mean 14 and you're living in a van and you're doing your math homework. Um, just going back into that time um, through the poem, I just wanted to revisit it. And also from my first book to remind myself or to hear my own voice uh, or actually for people who have joined us tonight to hear that I am still very much the same person. I, I sound the same, um, that uh, many of, of you have been discovering my writing through How to Pronounce Knife, but I've been doing uh, that writing um, for, you know, it didn't happen overnight. Um, it was um, for 25 years or uh, of, of writing, but, but two decades of publishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're also uh, uh, an audience member wants to know um, you're also now teaching fiction um, that you're teaching writing uh, what is that like um, it brings me it reminds me well when I teach I see that there are things that I know how to do that I don't think about that writers who are just beginning think too much about. Um, and many of them feel or have developed strange things about their own work, like dismissing it before it becomes anything. I just, that's not something I do, uh, even when it's not working, even when I know that it's, that this, that the thing I'm writing um, is not good, I don't care because I know that I can make it good. Um, and it's not there yet. And I can sit with that patience. Um, so just, it brings me back to, it makes me think about like how I write and why, why that's so different or why, yeah, why it feels different. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are um, running out of time. We're, our time is up, really. Um, just actually one final question, though, because I think there's a lot of um, similar questions here about the idea of voice and how right. do you develop that, right? Um, I think a lot of writers, especially younger writers, um, are struggling with that. And, and, and for you, you have such a kind of um, singular voice. Um, and so if there's any kind of Anything that you can say about that, right? About developing one's voice. Um. I think um, you should listen to how people talk. Um, one activity that I uh, make, I mean, I ask the writing students to do is to transcribe a film scene or um, a live conversation that's happening. And, and then to report back of what that experience was like, not just with the result of it. And many of them say, um, oh, people actually don't have interesting conversations. It's mostly <laughs> very, very logical or, or like, like, you know, I'm it's actually very boring. Like I'm gonna go there or we're gonna do this. Um, and it teaches them how to pick out what's interesting in a conversation um, and, uh, and it also teaches them like voice happens not with just the words but uh, where the pauses are where you punctuate um, how you describe the scene around the dialogue um, 
the dialogue can't just be there for no reason. Um, when it enters the text, um, it has to have value, um, perhaps even greater value than the text around it. Anytime a character speaks, that is a valuable moment. And so uh, I would just say, listen to how people talk. Um, and this is, you know, something you can do um, over time. Um, listen to the way that people talk. Um, don't just, you know, hang out with other writers. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, because other writers, they're also thinking the way that you think, and they're speaking in a very particular writerly way, and real people, you know, real, like, regular people don't, if you, so you have to have a variety of, um, of people Speakers. you're around yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like like a child or a grown-up or um and, and people who do different things in life um if you're all if you're around just professors um you know your writing will be very different um and it will sound a little but uh, no it was it will sound different um so also people in different walks of life. Um, in a life, you come across not just one type of field of work, um, but you will come, you know, every time we, in a social situation, we always ask each other, what do you do? Um, and we find out what they do. And, and it, if it's different, it's even, I feel like it's even more valuable because it's a voice you can listen to. Mm -hmm. That's really great advice and uh, a really great note for us to end on. Um, thank you so much, Sue, for the beautiful readings and the enlightening answers. Um, and and it's, it's been a great pleasure um, to be able to speak with you tonight. And um, thank you everyone for, uh, for being here and for coming and, and sharing this night. Um, Nancy and Wendy, do you wanna jump back on to um, say any parting words? Hi everybody, thank you. Thank you so much everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you, thank you Sue Bankman, Din, um, that was fantastic and the beautiful readings. Just like he said, they were so lovely and it was such a treat tonight. Um, I also wanna thank um, Renison University College for this fantastic um, partnership that we have and uh, everyone have a good night and take care. Good night everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.